What's up, y'all? We got a solo Cruton Corner pod today. No Bobby, no Ty, just Jameson. But let's talk about things because I feel like we've been waiting around all of this time. And, you know, us on the podcast have been doing this, waiting for Jackson Dart to commit, waiting for Caleb Williams to commit. We want to hit up a live episode, um, but that still hasn't happened. We've been waiting for three weeks of episodes to do that. But there's been a lot of things that have happened in recruiting that, you know, kind of, you know, still are very prominent, um, but not as much celebrated because we've been waiting for these big fish. And let's give, you know, some sunshine to what's been going on, you know, the new staff in terms of recruiting. So let's just kind of go down the list. And honestly, I think the most exciting one that I feel like not enough people are talking about is we have a brand new leader in terms of who is the quarterback in the 2023 class, Jackson Arnold, uh, not the Jackson dart. Like whenever I first saw it commit Jackson, I was like, Ooh, we, we might've gotten dart, but no Jackson Arnold coming through a guy that Jeff Levy really, really liked. Um, you know, at Ole Miss, and they had a good relationship. And as soon as he offered from OU, it seems like they had a strong bond. And with him being from Denton, uh, Denton, Texas, it seemed like it was a very, you know, quick commitment. He came in to visit last week, um, came through, and that's all he needed and committed within the next couple of days. So just kind of going through who he is and um, what Jackson Arnold's going to bring to this class. Um, we've talked about in these past class all the time. Uh, quarterbacks are your leaders. They are the people that bring in other people. They are the people that, um, you know, skill position say, I want to go play with him for the next three years of my career. Um, and he seems like he's got a lot of moxie to him. Seems like he's like a guy that will recruit. Um, and he's kind of a do it all quarterback. Uh, the way this, like the skill set he brings, it seems like he's kind of a dual threat, but also can be a pocket passer, can kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, and uh, he has this confidence that he brings himself onto the field. He might not have the strongest arm talent. He might not like um, sling it like you see um, some of these past quarterbacks that we've had at OU, but it seems like he's pretty good at about everything he does. And there's a reason why he's one of the top 50 players in the nation about and the best quarterback in Texas. So honestly, getting Jackson Arnold was huge, especially, you know, how big of a hole we had in that 2023 class, losing such a strong foothold we had with Malachi Nelson and all the people from Los Alamitos, except for DeAndre Moore, you know, that was a big hit because that's kind of what we were focusing our whole 2023 class around is building around, you know, Makai Lemon and Malachi Nelson. And once that fell through, we had to find someone to come in and, you know, break the cycle and make something bit different. So that was very huge. Um, I was very excited about it. But what really comes more um, with these commits and what I get excited about even more this quarterback, like I said, he's the leader. He brings other people. Who should we expect that he could recruit and bring in as well with him? Um, Peyton Bowen, it seems like is one of his teammates and is one of his really good friends who's a safety wide receiver target um, from the same high school in Denton. He's currently committed to Notre Dame, but he's a really high-end four-star and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of smoke between him and Jackson. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Jackson all try to get him to come to a couple, you know, uh, visits with him um, and kind of try to reel him in slowly. Uh, talking about Jackson Arnold visits, you know, this coming weekend is junior day. So all of those 2023 commits, they'll be visiting. Um, there's going to Jackson Arnold coming in for, you know, t- two straight weeks now. Um, coming and ready to recruit and getting all these guys coming in to try to be in Oklahoma sooner. Guys that are be coming in this weekend, um, you know, current um, O line commit Josh Bates, but guys that we'd be really kind of, you know, trying to get into this boat and get it moving in 2023. Running back Trey Wisner from Waco, Texas, is a guy that's been looking at OU for a long time now and speaks very highly of Demarco Murray. Um, for, just staying on the offensive side. Uh, Ashton Kozart from Flower Mound, Texas, um, another big time wide receiver that's been talking to OU for a long time. And uh, let me tell you something. Whenever I see certain recruits, uh, they still continue to talk about and still talk very highly of OU, even after this Lincoln Riley situation makes me feel like, oh, maybe we've got something serious here. Maybe this might be legitimate that they actually want to come to OU. 
Um, but when it comes down to Trey Wisner, you know, looping back to that, it's just because DeMarco Murray makes great relationships with these kids. We've seen it, you know, with Javante Barnes and Gavin Sawchuk. They stayed here for him. Um, but when it comes down to wide receivers, there's still a lot to prove. So Ashton Kozart's a guy we've been after for a long time, and we'll see if he is enticed at all with playing with a quarterback like Jackson Arnold. Other guys on the offense side of the ball, a um, couple of athletes, Jacoby Johnson and Micah Tease could play either way. Um, if you recognize the T's last name, you know, his big brother played at OU. Um, so he's from Tulsa, uh, miles T's. So we'll see, um, how he, um, handles this visit because junior day is a big deal. Um, he's been a heavy OU lean just because his family for a long time, but, um, definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, other guys that will be visiting for junior day, uh, by Joe, um, edge rusher, um, from Norman. It seems like he's been getting a lot of heat, um, in the recruiting trail for four star guy. And especially, you know, in our backyard, um, it's a big time get, if we could land a guy like that, we'll probably take a little bit more work with him. And then other guys just, um, that are just down the line. I'm just going to name these. I don't have too much, uh, to say about them. Uh, Jane Chapman, Logan Reichert, Caden Lee, Nigia Harris, Derek LeBlanc, Whit Weeks and Eric McCarty are all confirmed so far. Uh, but, Honestly, going to be a fun junior junior day, especially whenever you have the leader of this class already. Um, people gravitate to strong characters. You'll see that in all forms of history. If you have a strong leader, people grav gravitate towards it. So that's going to make this junior day even bigger of a deal. But that's 2023. Obviously, 2022 is the biggest thing that we want to talk about because obviously signing day is on the 3rd. Like that is in what, a week? Uh, that is coming up extremely soon. I feel like we've been having all these visits of all these 2022 guys that decided not to sign the early signing period and they're not committing. I'm like, okay, it's fine. They can wait till the, um, you know, national signing day. It's a little bit in the future. This is a week. So these guys, honestly, they need to start making up their minds. So let's just kind of roll down the, you know, the line and let's talk about the locks because this is our new emoji. And even though Lincoln started the emoji as kind of this Twitter clout thing, obviously it works and the recruits like it. So I'm down for it, but let's go through the locks because we had three of them and what were they? So first of all, one of them is Jackson Arnold. We figured that out. Um, and then uh, there's more than three, but there's three that came out of the last week of recruiting. The two other ones, Gentry Williams, a 2022 guy that has been committed to us, to us for a long time out of Tulsa, um, cornerback. He had not signed with us in the early signing day, really wanted to figure out what was this new coaching staff about, came in and visited last week, and he said, I'm done. No more visits. I'm shutting it down. I'm with OU. And they viewed that as a commit. It seems like that Brent Venables and crew are taking a much more old school view of committing to a school rather than with Lincoln Riley. If you commit to us, you can't go and take other visits. You can't silent commit and get your emoji out to the world on Twitter and then all of a sudden be like, hmm, never mind. We've seen that way too many times at OU where we see these eyes and we wait all year for them. They, they never materialize. Chris Steele comes to mind right off the bat, um, cornerback of who knows where he is now. I have no idea what's going on. USC, Florida, who knows? But guys like that where if they want to commit, You've got to say, I'm not going on any more visits. So that's a big deal. Gentry Williams committed, got the lock emoji, and he's shutting it down, should be signing with us come February. Um, but who's the other lock? And if you've been paying attention at all the 247 sports and their crystal balls, you know, you'd see there's one guy that's getting a lot of crystal balls to OU, and you'd see there's a guy on Twitter that just decommitted from Oregon, and that's Grayson Halton, four-star DN from um, San Diego area, you know, we didn't know much about him until this new co um, crew came through with Brent Venables. But watching his tape, you know, he's fun to see him come off the edge. Um, and whenever you have a guy that's committed to Oregon, he's a four-star commit, obviously there's going to be a lot of talent there. Um, but it's something exciting that we're finally trying to round out this defensive line class, something that we are a little bit worried about whenever Todd Bates comes in as our D-line coach. Like this is one of the better defensive line coaches in the nation. And it seems like you hear nothing but positive things about this guy from recruits whenever they talk about him after commits or after visits. Like this guy's making big time impressions on people. So Grayson Halton looks like he could be the next lock. Um, and he decommitted from Oregon. If he can't take any more visits, 
obviously he wouldn't be taking his visit to Oregon that he had planned this weekend. So if he doesn't take that visit, I think you can read the tea leaves there that he's probably an OU commit and we're just waiting on him to make it public after his decommitment from Oregon. Um, there's a couple of other locks we've had and it might've not just been, you know, uh, from this 2022 class and the 2023 class, obviously we got some transfers and we've been huge into the transfer market. We already kind of talked about, you know, our defensive backs that we got last week, but a new one that we got, and I know our comrade, um, from the pod boat and Blake wasn't happy about this. Tyler Guyton from TCU, um, coming out, uh, was a converted D line. It only played a year at TCU. And he transitioned to offensive line, but six foot seven of a monster of an athlete, a guy that's completely raw, that beaten bow is just going to completely go to work on and just shape him into something. And that's honestly going to be a really, really fun guy to watch moving forward because this, from what we read on him is, it seems like he's, you know, a high ceiling guy with a lot of risk. And when it comes down to the offensive line position, we recruit so many offensive linemen each year that it makes me think like, I think it's good at least one a cycle to take a a big time fly on a guy that might not be heavily, you know, highly rated. He might not have the most experience, but put him in beat him both system and let him learn and see what happens whenever he's a junior or a red shirt junior and see if he's got the skill set to take over. We've seen it all the time at OU that guys that, you know, um, we're D linemen. They move over to O line. We're trying to see that right now with Marcus Hicks. You're a good athlete. Sit in our system for a while. We're gonna have plenty of talent in front of you, so there's no rush for you to start whenever you're a true freshman or a sophomore, even if you're lucky enough. Um, you can sit around for a bit, and then whenever our guys go to the league a year early, you got a spot to come in as a junior, and you can try to do the same thing again. So I think it's great high end swing. Cause why not? Cause we've got some more sturdy guys in front of them. Like, you know, Jake Taylor and Jacob Sexton guys that, you know, are established and been playing the position for a while now. I've been to many camps playing that position. You know, Tyler got, even though he's a year older than them um, will be kind of a swing for us. Uh, so that's really exciting. I know the TCU people are really upset about that, but um, sorry, that sucks. Let's talk more about 2022 targets because there's still plenty to figure out of what's going on here. Um, who are we going to get? Who are we going to round out with in the next week? Next time we talk to y'all, hopefully it should be before um, National Signing Day because I'm hoping we can get to do a little bit of a live pod reaction to Jackson Arnold or Caleb Williams committing, which I would hope would happen next week, but we said that for the past three weeks. So let's talk about guys that we're looking at. And I think the three biggest names, and they're all big guys. So let's talk about the defensive linemen first. So Ahmad Moten from Florida, and then R. Mason Thomas also from Florida. These are guys that we've been targeting with the new staff. And it seems like we've been having some good momentum. R. Mason Thomas, if you guys do not recall, is an Iowa State commit, but his rankings have been just firing up in the recruiting cycle. But the more his ratings go up, it's probably because a lot of other teams are starting to take a look at him. And whenever you come out from Florida, you might be a little bit worried that teams like the Gators or teams like Miami might be coming to poach them. And it's going to be hard for to convince a Florida kid to not go to a Florida school and come to Oklahoma. Even though Oklahoma produces plenty of offensive linemen, if I am getting my hometown school, the team that's been in my backyard this whole time, to come recruit me here at the end, the same thing as Oklahoma, I'm probably going to pick Miami. So I'm a little bit nervous. R. Mason Thomas looks like uh, Mario Cristobal is putting the press on him. So even though he's been leaning OU, even though he's still commit to Iowa State, he's weighing his options. Um, you know, probably whenever he committed to, uh, to Iowa State, he didn't think he had as many options. But whenever his stock is rising and he's getting some more, you know, high-end blue blood schools looking at him, I don't think Iowa State's in the picture anymore. So Miami versus us, I think it's going to be a big time war. And I can't tell you who I think is going to get that one to tell you the truth. But I have to lean Miami. I haven't read anything about who he's leaning towards. But whenever you're from that area and Mario Cristobal is putting the press on you to move over there, you know, Miami's got a fun defense. And I'm sure he grew up watching all of the turnover chain here the past couple of years. It's kind of hard not to beat that whenever it's OU versus Miami for a Miami kid. Ama Moten, I could see him being an OU guy. It looks like we just got another crystal ball for him. 
um, coming into OU. So I'm excited about that. Um, just another big time defensive lineman, interior guy, um, trying to get big guys, honestly, on this team, something that we haven't seen in a long time uh, from OU. Whenever Grinch was trying to get slimmer guys, this guy's six foot three, 290, and that's just what he has in his system. You never know how much more he weighs because it seems like these recruiting sites put stuff up and they don't get changed for a year. So he could be over 300 pounds easy. Um, put him in Schmitty's system. Let him work for a couple years. Let's get some big guys to plug up the middle because whenever you go to the SEC in a couple years, they're going to have even bigger offensive linemen and even stronger running backs. And playing fast isn't the move anymore. You've got to be big enough and play fast at the same time. So these little scrawny, uh, you know, edge rushers plus our nickel backs aren't going to stop the right tackle blocking, you know, a Najee Harris coming out the outside for Alabama. And it's just not going to work anymore. So getting big guys for the middle, the plug up the middle, I think is big. And it seems like that we're making that move there. Um, and, you know, Brent Venables comes from Clemson, even though that's not SEC, but that's probably the darn closest thing you could see to an SEC defense that wasn't there um, the past couple of years. You know, we already saw Alton Tarber that he gra grabbed interior D lineman, 305 pounds. That he that he is, you know, we're making moves to try to be a high end defense rather than a gimmicky defense. That speed D um, that we had planned with Brent um, with a uh, with Grinch. So let's talk a little bit more about some other guys. Josh Connerly is probably the, you know the biggest star that we're looking at in terms of guys that we would want at this recruiting cycle next week for 2022 five-star offensive lineman. And he's another guy that's intrigued by beat and bow. Obviously beat and bow puts guys in the league and he's a personable guy. And it seems like he recruits really well. Um, but here's the problem. He's from the Northwest and it's hard to pull guys from out there. We've seen it all the time. Five-star offensive lineman being interested into Oklahoma and coming down to the end and we losing out last second to people that are closer. Tristan Lee. I don't know if there was something behind the scenes of Tristan Lee when it came down to the East Coast and Clemson. Probably was. But still, it's tough to take guys from their hometown. He seems like he's a guy. What he's saying is he would want his parents to come to all the games. And it's going to be tough, even if we give him all the money of the NIL that we can promise for his parents to keep on flying out Saturdays to watch those games. You know, Money is great. We can give plenty of money through the NIL deal, but you can't give the time away and all of the effort of getting from the Northwest down to Oklahoma because I guarantee you this is probably where they're coming from. I mean, let's look it up. Is there a direct flight to Oklahoma City um, to where he's from? They're going to have layovers. It's just going to it's gonna be a chore to go to every one of his games. And even though they want to, you know, be, being from Seattle, I mean, is he going to – you know, the parents are going to want to go to every single game and make that flight every single time. Um, here's some good podcast investigation work. I've got to check this out. Seattle to Oklahoma City. Let's see if they have direct. Oh, they do have some direct flights. Here we go. Alaska Airlines. I mean, that's not bad, but three and a half hours, guys. Three and a half hours for him to his parents to fly out to come out to Oklahoma every single game. Let's not talk about getting to the airport and then driving 20 minutes to Norman as well. So let's say about four hours for, of travel for them to get to their destination every single time and then four hours back. You know, four hours is four hours, but still that's a chore. So in all honesty, we can hope for Josh Connerly, but I just don't think that's going to be an option for us. Uh, another five-star offensive lineman that we're really hoping for, um, you know, but another guy that's tough and then we're in the top two for um, is uh, this, oh my God, I'm just completely blanking on his name. I'm look, I'm feeling pretty stupid here. I got y'all. I got y'all. Um, okay. Screw this. Devon Campbell. God bless America. Sorry, y'all. Okay. Devon Campbell. And he's from Texas, but, you know, if I am between OU and Texas and as an offensive lineman and Texas has a very clear offensive line NIL deal set up where if you just show up, you get a hundred thousand dollars. That's tough. 
and he seems like he's been a Texas lean and he has a lot of Texas people chirping in his ears for a long time now. And even though he loves beat him, you guys seeing a theme here, offensive linemen love beat him, comes down to it, staying close to home wins. And it sucks whenever you lose like that, but it's just going to happen. So I wouldn't be surprised at all. To see Campbell stay close to home and play in Austin as well. Okay. I think that's it for the biggest points of recruiting. Those are the names we want to watch. There's still a lot to happen. 2023 is going to be fun. We'll continue to watch that and see Jackson Arnold being the new face, being the leader, see if you can bring in guys. Um, but just ending out this pod, because obviously if you're talking anything OU football, the names Caleb Williams and Jackson Dart have to be muttered. I've already said it a couple times, but I kind of want to give my take on it from now. Um, and I think it's quite obvious, and I think a lot of people are seeing this, that obviously they're linked. Um, they're, you know, Jackson Dart leaving USC, Caleb Williams looking at USC. It's obviously of who's going to commit first, and I'm going to read and react to that. And Jackson Dart probably just waiting on Caleb Williams, saying like, okay, Caleb, you're not sure about USC? I'll just sit here and wait too. I can take online courses. I can probably still be fine because who cares? The academic advisors for each college are just going to push me into the classes anyway. I don't. I can show up three weeks late and still be fine. I'm talented enough to where, you know, even if I did miss some kind of grade here and there, I'm probably going to still get a B in the course with all of the help they give athletes. Uh, time is of the essence and people are like, oh, you have this deadline and whatnot. You can override a class to get into it with the permission of the instructor. And with how the football program is set up, they have so many connections with the instructor that these guys can get into whatever class they so need, and they can go probably over capacity if they needed to, if the class is full, um, for these football players to come in three weeks late into classes. So I'm not I'm not worried with time, and I don't think Caleb Williams is worried with time either. It seems like he's still enrolled at OU. He's still taking classes, and he'll probably just do that and then just transfer those credits right back over to the next school that he'll go to. And – I still don't believe that this Wisconsin thing is real from him. I, I mean, it could happen, but a, there's a lot of hatred going around about Caleb Williams and what his decision is going to be. But this Wisconsin news coming out, does this not make any of y'all just feel a little bit bad for him? It honestly, like the first thing that I said out of my mouth whenever I read it, because Caleb Williams obviously was one of the best players in college football last year as a true freshman in an absolutely hectic situation with Lincoln Riley, a guy that might have had his foot out the door and plenty of issues in Oklahoma, but still shined as a true freshman who didn't even start the beginning of the season, had to pick up things as he went. And now he's in a situation where I don't know if I want to go to USC because do I actually trust this Lincoln Riley guy? But I would want to come back to OU, but the fans hate me now. It's tarnished. It seems like me going in the portal to do things the right way so I could talk to other schools and see my options was not a good thing for my reputation. And if I came back to Oklahoma, I feel like I'd get a lot of good, you know, you know, reception, but there's going to be some people that hold it against me. And I think the coaching staff is probably going to hold it against them too. And that's why they said they pretty much moved on from Caleb. They're not pitching to Caleb anymore. They're saying what they have for him, but they're not going to go balls to the wall for Caleb Williams. And that's what he's looking for. And it seems like he can't find what he's looking for. And I honestly feel bad for him. He got put in a horrible situation. The kid, like I said, came to Oklahoma, not because of the location, not because of the program's history, not because of any of that. He came for Lincoln Riley, and Lincoln Riley went and left without telling him right at the end and kind of blindsided him. And the kid's like, what do I do now? And now means I have to go look at every other school possible. I've got to go see what's best for me because I don't know if OU is what's best for me. I have no idea what's going on here. It's an absolute brand new system. I would rather probably go to something that's more established and that's been there for a while. The problem with that is things move fast. And it seems like he kept not getting good breaks and he thought about it and thought that USC wasn't this wonderful place to go to because their offensive line is trash and Lincoln Riley. I don't know if I can trust him again. What if next year USC goes 
you know, they lose five games. And then Dallas Cowboys lose again in the divisional round, fire Mike McCarthy. I wouldn't be surprised if you see Lincoln Riley take some looks there. And guess what? He's moving again. And then Caleb Williams, who still needs to do another year to get to the pros, is like, I have just went with this guy twice now, and he's burned me twice. I know USC is not a terminal job. It's not an end job. And I absolutely know there's a chance that he can move on from this. And the chances of him doing next year are slim, but there's still a chance. I don't want to take that if I'm Caleb Williams. So I know that's in the back of his head. And if it wasn't, he would be a commit to USC, and there'd be no doubt in my mind. But he's thinking that. Just the thought of Wisconsin, though, is sad. It feels like all of his options are kind of running out. Um, you know, people talk about Georgia. People talk about, you know, all these other schools. But Wisconsin, really, you see what they've done with one, a very highly rated quarterback, you know, that they don't get often at Wisconsin. And Graham Mertz looked like trash these past couple of years. I at least thought watching his high school tape that he was talented enough to get past what Wisconsin has been giving him. But it's been tough. I don't know if I want to go to Wisconsin other than Russell Wilson. You know, it's hard for me to think about Wisconsin being a quarterback school. So it, it's tough. It, it worries me for Caleb Williams. And I'm honestly, I feel bad for him now. I, I don't feel any kind of hatred towards him. I think he did what he was supposed to do. I think he was trying to do things the right way. And I understand there might've been some NIL negotiation deals that kind of, he just got caught holding, you know, holding the bag and waited too long and asked for too much. But this kid, you know, 19 years old, and his, I'm sure his parents had a huge part in it. And whenever you have that, that much leverage in a situation, there's a lot of us that would push for as much as we can. I'm a negotiator. I would push and try to penny pinch as much as I can to get every single ounce I could. And sometimes that comes back and blows up in your face. Happens to all of us, whether that be you're going to the casino, whether that happens, you know, I don't know, negotiating just a deal at work or something like that happens to all of us. And it just happened on a macro scale for him. And I feel horrible for him because he's still a kid. Um, we got 1982 Boomer Sooner in the chat saying, do you agree we need a new scholarship quarterback behind the UCF transfer? I absolutely agree with that, 1982, because I don't want a true freshman or a walk-on coming on You know, if Dylan Gabriel gets hurt. Dylan Gabriel was a guy that got hurt last year. And um, people that are coming off injuries and people that haven't played as much football of recently are more prone to soft tissue injuries um, than your normal person. I understand he has a complete spring to go through everything and get through back through the motions and the muscle memory. But people have been out of football. When they come back that next year, there's a chance they could pull a groin, a hamstring, something like that, just because their body isn't used to the toll it's taking on them of a college football season. So, yes, I would not want it where we're – all of a sudden, we started off the season really well, and we beat Texas, and Dylan Gabriel was doing great for us. But on, on a run, scrambling outside the pocket, he pulled a hamstring because he went too fast. And now going into a next game versus a big-time Big 12 opponent, we're having to rely on Evers or we're having to rely on Rucker. I'm a little bit worried about that. So having a good backup that's the least experienced is needed, and we'll find someone – you know, it, uh, it might not be a Jackson Dart because he's a starting quarterback who should be, you know, at a big time program. It might have to be, you know, a grad transfer backup from somewhere or, you know, a guy that's a sophomore from another school that wasn't as highly rated and he's stuck behind someone. But coming to OU, at least you can see a clear in second string quarterback. Um, as an option, I don't think getting, you know, another starting caliber quarterback is going to happen. And you, and you say Juco, and I, I just don't think we've talked about this in the past. I'm just worried that Juco not, might not be much of a thing for schools like OU anymore. I think of the transfer portal and how this one-time free transfer has worked. And especially with NIL deals, I think that Juco ranks, unless you're an absolute stud, you know, we're probably not going to come out of Juco and come be a legitimate contributor to a team like Oklahoma because of how much what we looked at as Juco past two, two, three years ago um, is now transfer portal poaching guys from their team before they even hit the portal, talking in channels behind the back, figuring out who guys, what guys are uncertain. So we're going to see someone, but 
I, my take on Jackson Dart kind of transitioning this to end the pod, I I don't believe that he's going to end up at OU. I just see him ending up at Ole Miss. We heard that, you know, Trigg liked Ole Miss a little bit better, but Dart liked OU a little, a little bit better. But him waiting this long, you know, what's the point? Why would he be waiting this long if he was going to end up committing to OU? He obviously is waiting on Caleb Williams because USC is in the back of his mind. Um, but – Ole Miss has this as a starting option for him and Zach Evans as his running back. And I, it's hard for me to think that he wouldn't go there. It's a much clearer start for Jackson Dart. You know, it's tough. It really is tough because you'd think like, oh, all these quarterbacks want to come to OU, but it's it's a different, you know, it's a different mantra nowadays. I understand that we're OU and we're a blue blood, but Lincoln Riley was the quarterback whisperer. So not all quarterbacks, no matter what, want to come to OU anymore. It's a it's a different it's different times, and we have to get used to that. But Dylan Gabriel, I think even if Jackson Dart came, Jackson Dart would have a lot of trouble, you know, taking over the job from Dylan Gabriel because Dylan Gabriel knows Levy's system so well, and he's a veteran. He's played you know starting football in Division One, uh, not something that Dart hasn't done too much of. He's done it a little bit, but not as much. So a guy that already knows Levy's system, that is very good friends with the offensive coordinator already to begin with, would be hard to beat out. And I know Jackson Dart says, I don't want to waste my talent, even though I'm probably better than this guy. They might pull him because he understands the offense better, and it might be a close race. I don't want to have to take that risk because if I don't start a year of my life, that's money down the drain with NIL. Every single game you don't start, every single game that your name is not in the news is money down the drain. So I need to go somewhere that I can start and put my name out there and show the world my talent. Other than that, I went longer than I thought I was. I was planning on keeping this pretty short. Talking to myself for 32 minutes is a little bit weird, but I had a lot to talk about with recruiting and obviously with Caleb Williams and obviously with Jackson Dart. There's so much speculation and just so much waiting. Um, But it was fun, and I'm, I'm glad that I got to do this. But keep an eye out whenever you see these guys commit, whenever you see Jackson Dart or Caleb Williams commit. We have been legitimately on call just waiting for it. Ty and Bobby and I have just been waiting for that to drop so we can just hit our podcast for the week right after that happens. So as soon as that happens, be ready. You'll get the notification on YouTube if you're already subscribed to us and get notifications But if you're listening right now, make sure you do that so you can know. Maybe you didn't even know that Caleb Williams or Jackson Dart committed. Where you get that notification sent to your phone, you can come listen to us, and we'll talk, and we'll roll through it, and we'll kind of break it down what happens. Uh, Maybe it might be good news. Maybe it might be bad news. But I think it's worthwhile for you to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can know whenever we go live. So what we're talking, if whether that's breaking news or our weekly podcast. But other than that, it's still the off season. Keep watching some OU basketball. I'm glad we ended our losing streak. Uh, you know, keep looking for National Signing Day next week. That'll be fun to talk about. I'll talk about plenty about recruiting next week. And then, other than that, let's hopefully we hear some more things about Schmidt's workout plans on Twitter from the um, from the players because that's been really fun. There's plenty of things to talk about with Oklahoma football. It's a year round sport. So y'all stay in tune to the Schooner Pod, and we'll bring you all the up-to-date news on it. And y'all stay safe out there, all right?